What is going on guys? My name is Kenji and welcome back to my channel. Hope it's not the first time you're watching one of my videos, but just in case it is, I'm a doctor working in London. And guys, I'm sure a lot of you have watched my day in the life videos, but this is actually a small snippet of what my actual day is like. I obviously film and summarize my day just to give you guys a bit of a taste as to what I do as a doctor on a daily basis. And for the very first time, I actually tracked my entire day from 9 a.m. to 5 p.m. as a doctor, minute by minute, to give you guys an exact representation of what we do as doctors. Now, I honestly say this with absolute honesty and truth, that I don't think that the majority of the population actually know what we do as a doctor. If you watch TV and you watch a bunch of YouTubers, including myself, a lot of the times it seems really amazing and you're like saving lives every single second, but that is far from the truth. And I wanna show you guys what a realistic day in the life is actually like by tracking every single minute that I spent in the hospital, whether it was actually giving treatment and actually saving a life or whether it was just sitting around and doing discharge letters or whatever that might be. So let's go ahead. I actually wrote it all down on my laptop and take you guys through an average day in the life as a first year doctor. On this particular day, I actually arrived at the hospital at 9.07. I am very ashamed to tell you guys that. In all honesty, I'm normally pretty early and pretty on time being at the hospital, but for whatever reason that day, I got there and I got to the ward at 9.07 a.m. So seven minutes late. But thank God on this actual day, I was in the a &E department, the actual pediatric a &E department to be more specific, meaning that there is no ward round. So normally if we're on the ward, we start at 9 a.m. sharp and the entire ward, including the consultant, is there ready to go to talk about the patients and to see the patients. But thank God I was in the a &E department, so there was no ward round. And oftentimes as well in the a &E department, we don't really get patients until later on in the day because of course children are sleeping and they need time to actually wake up and get sick. So 9.07, I got to the ward. I spent around 13 minutes up to 9.20, basically saying hi to all of the staff, saying hi to the consultant, the nurses and everyone. I unpacked my bags and I also put on my stethoscope and the rest of my everyday carry as a junior doctor, which you can watch and check out the link up above. Now that's what I did for the first 20 minutes. From around 9.20, 9.30 till 10 a.m., I then sat down on the uh, computer and I accessed the computers and I started doing all of the discharge letters from the following day. Now essentially when a patient comes to the ward or comes to the hospital, they have to go home with a discharge letter, essentially summarizing what happened to them through the entire stay at the hospital, the reason why they were admitted to the hospital, what drugs we started them on, what sort of treatments we gave them, what investigations we had and what results they were given. And then we actually put this all in a letter, we give it to the patient, and then we also send one to their GP, to their family doctor, so that they know exactly what happened while this patient was with us in the hospital. So I spent around 40 minutes from 9.20 a.m. to 10 a.m. doing discharge letters. As I mentioned, there were no patients around, so I couldn't actually see any patients. So I started writing all the discharge letters for the patients that we saw on the previous day. If I'm honest with you guys, a big bunch of the job as a junior doctor is doing loads of admin tasks. Sometimes you might think we're on the chest every single day, giving chest compressions and saving lives. But to be quite honest with you, a lot of our time as junior doctors is spent, sat down doing admin stuff. And that is exactly how I started off my morning. Personally, I don't mind that. I don't mind sitting there on a desk with a laptop with a nice coffee by my side, sipping on that, maybe having a bit of a snack for my breakfast. I don't really mind that. The first 40 minutes of my day were spent doing admin work. Now from 10 a.m. to 10.30 p.m., I actually had, sorry, 10.30 a.m., I actually had one of my colleagues, which I really liked. So we sat down and we had a bit of a half an hour chat about how he studied in India and the process of him actually coming to the UK and starting work in the UK. I also told him about my journey getting to medical school. And if you guys have seen my channel, you know that I actually did a degree before coming to medical school, uh, which was biomedical science and then I got into medicine afterwards. We just had a nice back and forth chat about our journeys into medical school and that was over a nice coffee. We were still sat in the A&E department but both had a nice coffee while discussing our own journeys into medicine. That was around half an hour, nice and chilled morning so far. And at 10.30 a.m., thank God I had my first patient. I actually saw this first patient with my colleague who was my registrar. This was a around a five, six year old child who came in with a viral induced wheeze. Now, because we're in the UK and we're getting very close to winter, a lot of kids who don't necessarily have asthma diagnosed, but they have wheeze or wheezy lungs. He came in being quite unwell. He was wheezing a lot. His breathing was very, very fast. And we essentially had to take a full history. So I took a full history from the child or from the mother. I spoke to the mother about why the patient's here, what's been going on recently. We made a diagnosis of viral induced wheeze. This is after I obviously examined their chest, their heart, their tummy. I did a full examination on the child. We made the diagnosis of viral induced wheeze. And then I actually started this patient on 
salbutamol. So we gave, we gave them salbutamol nebulizer through the nebulizer and that allowed the patient to open up his airways, open up his lungs. And we also gave him some Atrovent, which is actually um, ipatropium bromide. And that again is another sort of medication we use here in the UK to help open up the patient's lungs. So I gave it to the nurse and I asked the lovely nurse to please help me give the medication to the patient. And she did so. And then we allowed the patients to sit there to allow the medication to basically work. And then I went back to doing my discharge letters around 10.50 a.m. with a plan to review the patient later on in the day to see how they're doing. So 10.50 a.m. I sat down and I was back on the desk doing more discharge letters. This was all the way up until around 11.20 a.m. At 11.20 a.m. after working super hard all morning, I decided to take a little 10 minute break and I actually had some nuts in the sort of common room area. If you guys have seen my what's in my everyday carry or my backpack video as a junior doctor, you know that I always carry a bunch of nuts in my backpack. So I actually took those nuts out and had a bit of a snack, spent around 10 minutes, you know, again, drinking my coffee, having some nuts and just chilling before things got too crazy later on in the day. At about 11.30 a.m., this is around maybe 45 minutes to an hour after I last saw the patient, I went back to see the same patient, but this time with the consultant. Now, as a junior doctor, what you normally have to do is hand over this patient or discuss the patient with your senior. Now, that was originally with my registrar, but now the consultant came around and wanted to know what is going on with his patients that were on the ward. So I chatted to my consultant. I gave a very brief handover. I told him exactly who the patient is, why they were here, what are their observations or their vital signs like, what treatment we started them on. Gave them a very nice kind of overview of the patient. And then me and the consultant actually went to review the patient again after having given them some medication to help their lungs. Now, while the consultant was again, just examining the patient, I was actually scribing or documenting what the consultant was saying in terms of his history and also in terms of his examination. But then the consultant actually wanted to do a chest x-ray to make sure this patient did not have a chest infection going on. So what I did is I went onto the computer, requested a chest x-ray, and I actually had to walk to the ultrasound department after this to discuss with the radiologist and actually tell them why we want a scan. So oftentimes in hospital, when you request a scan, you have to go and discuss the scan with the radiologist who will be doing the scan or who will be at least accepting the scan. And thank God this actual radiologist was happy to do the scan. So I went back to the A&E department and I told the patient that they need to go for the scan. So they went for the scan. I then handed this over to the consultants to review the scan later on. At around 12 o'clock after finishing off with this one patient, I then went back and sat down to do my discharge letters once again. Now, again, you're noticing a bit of a pattern here, guys, in terms of admin work. The first admin work in the day was discharge letters. The second one was actually requesting a chest x-ray and then going to discuss this with the radiologist. And then after that, I went back again to sit down to do some more discharge letters. Now, this is when things get really interesting. I want to take a second to actually tell you guys how I managed to get through medical school, which is through the help of Picmonic, who are kindly sponsoring this video. What I really love about Picmonic, and if you guys have been on my channel for a while now, you know that I have been really singing the praises about Picmonic. The reason being is that unlike other resources that I use in medical school, who just give you the information and expect you to digest it and memorize it for the rest of your life, what Picmonic does is really unique. Picmonic actually gives you guys a picture, a mnemonic, and a storyline that allows you to memorize anatomy and all of these sort of content that you need to know from medical school really, really easily. Now, I will never forget the day in medical school in my third year where I literally spend five minutes watching the Picmonic storyline and tying that in with the mnemonic and the pictures that they gave me. And literally from that five minute session on my laptop that I had, I was able to fully memorize all of the bones in the hand up until this very day as a doctor. So when I'm learning, let's say the bones in the hand, I always start off by watching the educational video that Picmonic give, followed by the storyline they give afterwards. And here is a quick example of the educational video. Bones are described in this picmonic by the eight carpal bones. The mnemonic to help remember these bones is some lovers try positions that they can't handle shown as the lovers trying positions until they can't handle it anymore. Once they give you this educational video, it's a combination of this video, the picture, and the mnemonic that really tricks your brain into memorizing all of this content super easily. After that, I then watched the storyline, and here is a quick example of the hand bone story. And it's during times like these that some lovers try positions that they can't handle. First, they tried a new position on scaffolding, where the whole world could see just how adventurous they were but they fell before anyone noticed. So then they went even higher, to the lunar landscape. But this position always left one lover hanging. 
Once you actually learn the mnemonic and the storyline, what Pygmalion does amazingly is they actually give you a quiz to actively test your knowledge on the actual content that you're trying to learn. And as you guys know, active recall is one of the best methods of learning content by doing quizzes and testing yourself on the content. And what's really cool is you're actually able to edit these Pygmonics to give your own content that you learned on the side to add to your entire Pygmonic storyline and content. All of the content on Pygmonic is always up to date as well, with the students being able to add to the given database base on the Pygmonic system, which is also superimposed by all of the Pygmonic experts that make sure it's always up to date. Another cool thing that Pygmonic does to make it really easy to learn content is all of the actual characters are all related across all of the different storylines across different types of topics. And finally, what's really useful as a doctor on my day-to-day -day job is that Pygmonic is available on my laptop, on my phone, on my iPad, and across all of my devices. If you guys want to check out Pygmonic for yourself, then I'll leave a link down below in the description to get you guys a nice discount off of Pygmonic. At least check it out for yourself. There also is a free trial if you want to check it out. That is Pygmonic, and let's get back to the rest of the video. When I went to sit down, a dietitian actually came up to me and asked me to actually help them do a blood sample for one of their patients. Before I was actually able to help this dietitian, we actually received a crack crash call or a resus call. Essentially what this means is that we're given prior notice from the ambulance. The ambulance service told us that they're bringing in a child who is acutely unwell and who are actually having a seizure. This is when all the buzzers go off in the a &E department and we all ran to the scene and we started getting all the equipment ready, all of the medications ready to treat this patient who will be coming in very shortly uh, with this seizure. Now in around five minutes, the patient came in and they obviously were acutely unwell, they're having a seizure. And what my role and responsibility here was because I'm in pediatric, uh, because these are children, I don't actually have very much of a big sort of physical role in this patient. But what I was doing as part of the pediatric team is I was on the computer and I was basically taking orders from my registrar and my consultants. They were asking for things like to order x-ray scans, it was a chest x-ray, which I had to order. With a chest x-ray, I put it on the computer. Then you actually have to call the radiology department and tell them you need an urgent portable x-ray to bring the x-ray machine to the actual resus area that we're in. They were asking me to run some blood samples and I did that on the computer again and I send that to the labs. They were asking me to prescribe some medication for this patient. Obviously the consultants are there trying to put in, you know, cannulas and lines into the patient and they were, you know, examining the patient, but I was able to, you know, prescribe the medication that they wanted. The nurses at the desk are able to actually go get the medication and give the medication to the patient. They were asking me about the history of the patient. I had the computer in front of me. So I was able to actually go on the computer and actually look at where this patient's from, which consultants have seen, you know, have they actually been seen in clinic before? Are they known to a, uh, to a consultant previously for their seizures. I was doing all of that. It was extremely stressful. I won't lie to you guys. I was really supporting the, you know, the kind of the patient and supporting the whole entire team with regards to this uh, resus situation. This was actually such a cool point in my day, guys. When I was a medical student, there actually were two medical students and a nursing student who were around us, but they weren't allowed to go in the room because of how busy it was with all the doctors trying to help. I know what it was like three months ago, being a medical student and not being able to be part of the team, not having the responsibility to help out with an acutely unwell well uh, patient. This is one of my first times being, you know, having the responsibility to be a doctor finally and be there in the room, actually being able to help the patient, even though I'm not like physically touching the patient, I am able to prescribe medication. I'm able to do all of these scans and request all of these blood tests and all of these things. It was amazing to like see the medical students off in the distance while I'm actually for the first time being involved in the direct care of an acutely unwell patient. And of course, afterwards I was, you know, discussing with the medical students what's going on, doing a bit of teaching. I was also talking to the parents and updating them on what's going on with their child, giving them some reassurance as well. And that was lovely. And we were actually there for an hour and 45 minutes, for quite a while basically, trying to get this patient back to how they normally are and try to treat them. At around 1.45 p.m., I then decided that I'm really hungry and let me actually have lunch before seeing more patients. As a doctor, we normally have half an hour lunch, but unfortunately because I was, well not unfortunately, but because I was helping this patient out, I was only able to take 15 minutes of lunch before going to my afternoon teaching. So from 2 to 3 p.m., I had teaching. Now, now, as junior doctors, we normally have teaching on a Wednesday. I think this teaching session was on urological emergencies. So we had a consultant come and teach us, a consultant urologist, come and teach us F1 doctors about what it's like to be a urologist and all this sort of urological emergencies that we can expect to see in our lives as a doctor. This was super useful because I have an A&E job coming up in adult medicine. And it's really important because I will be seeing patients who are acutely unwell with urological conditions. So that was an hour. We also get given free lunch, which is really nice. So I had a nice hour break from the ward or from the A department. And at 3 p.m. I then took another 25 minutes just trying to finish off my lunch, taking a little bit of a break as well and heading back to the pediatric assessment unit later on at 3.25 p.m. I got 
to the a &E around 3 p.m. or 3.30 p.m., sorry. It's around about a five minute walk from my teaching center to the a &E department. Now, we're obviously in the last hour and a half of my day, so I was only able to see one more patient. I saw a newborn baby with suspected sepsis. So if you guys are medical, you know that sepsis is a really sort of dangerous condition that kids can potentially face. So I saw this 10 month old baby, and of course, all of these details are changed to maintain the confidentiality of my patients. But I saw a 10 month old baby, took a full history from the mother. I examined the baby and I was really concerned about this baby. The reason being is that their vital signs, their observations were all over the place, which were very suspicious of sepsis. So in sepsis, you have hypotension, so low blood pressure in the patient. You also have tachycardia, so a very fast heart rate. And you also, a lot of the times, have a fever associated with this. So this baby, had a very high fever, I think it was about 39.8, and they also had a very strong work of breathing. So I have I had very like good evidence to suggest this patient is probably septic. What I did is I called in my consultant straight away. I handed over this patient to the consultant. I discussed it with them. The consultant came and reviewed the patient, thought they were actually doing really unwell, as I thought as well. And the consultant gave me the plan and the order to start antibiotics straight away, to do a full septic screen on this patient, and then also to hand over to the ward to admit this patient. So this was a very long and complex time, you know, time period. I had an hour and a half, which was to, you know, look at the patient, examine them and all, all this, you know, the sort of stuff to do with that. I then had to speak to my consultant about the patient. He then had to come and see the patient himself. And then what I had to do is get a prescription chart, start prescribing all the medication, start taking bloods, start taking a blood culture, start doing the full septic screen. Once that was done, I then had to call up the registrar in the actual ward, you know, where all the long-term patients are on the uh, pediatric ward. I then had to hand over this patient and explain explain the whole entire situation, who the patient is, why they're here, why I think they're sick, and why I think they need admission. And then once that was all done, that took around an hour and a half. And once that was done, it was literally 5 p.m. on the dot, and I was actually able to leave work on time, which is always amazing to have. Hopefully you guys see that it's not always, you know, saving lives all the time. Hopefully you see that there is a huge part of the job, which is basically admin. You know, you only get to see a handful of patients during your day for many reasons, like having teaching like I did. Maybe if you're in the A&E department. There's no patients to be seen in the morning. Sometimes I only see two patients, sometimes really busy and I see 10 patients, 12 patients. It really does vary. And that really is the beauty of being a doctor. Your day is completely varied. You spend loads of time you're doing different things here and there. You go to teaching, you know, you see patients, you're on the ward, you're on the special care baby unit, you're everywhere. That is a day in my life, minute by minute. I hope you guys have really enjoyed this. If you have, please leave a like and a comment as well. Make sure you're subscribed down below with notifications on to never miss another upload. And before you guys go, here are a bunch of videos on my channel you might wanna watch before you leave. Thank you so much for watching and I'll see you guys on the next one.